ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಸಬ್ಕೋ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವಾರ್ಮ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಒನ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವಿದ್ಯಾಶಂಕರ್ ಎ ವಿ ಎ ಪ್ರೌಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರೌಡ್ ಪ್ರಿವಿಲೇಜ್ ವಾಲಂಟಿಯರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಒನ್ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವಾಲಂಟಿಯರ್ ಡ್ರಿವನ್ ನಾನ್ ಪ್ರಾಫಿಟ್ ಕಲೆಕ್ಟಿವ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿವಿಜುವಲ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಅಪ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಟಿ ವಿತ್ ವಾಲಂಟಿಯರ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅಕ್ರಾಸ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಟು ಪ್ರೊವೈಡ್ ಫ್ರೀ ಆಕ್ಸೆಸ್ ಟು ಹೆಲ್ತ್ ಕೇರ್ ವೈ ಆರ್ ಟೆಲಿಮೆಡಿಸನ್ ಟು ದ ಸಿಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ ಅಫೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಕೋವಿಡ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಪ್ಯಾಂಡಮಿಕ್ ಡ್ಯೂರಿಂಗ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಡೇಸ್ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಒನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಡ್ ಔಟ್ ಇನ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅ ಮೇಡ್ ಅ ಸಿಗ್ನಿಫಿಕೆಂಟ್ ಇಂಪ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫೈಟ್ ನೌ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಅ ಟೀಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫೈವ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ತ್ರೀ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ವಾಲಂಟಿಯರ್ಸ್ ಟೀಮ್ ಥರ್ಟಿ ಟು ವಾಲಂಟಿಯರ್ ಕಂಪನೀಸ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬೀನ್ ಸಕ್ಸಸ್ಫುಲ್ ಇನ್ ರೀಚಿಂಗ್ ತ್ರೀ ಮಿಲಿಯನ್ ಸಿಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ ಟಿಲ್ ಡೇ ಅಂಡ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಡನ್ ಟು ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಟೆಲಿ ಕನ್ಸಲ್ಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಇನ್ ಪ್ರಿವೆನ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೋರ್ ದನ್ ಟೂ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ ಕಾಂಟ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಒನ್ ಅಪೀಲ್ಸ್ ಟು ದ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸಿಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ ಔಟ್ ದೇರ್ ವಾಚಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ to come forward for volunteering and join the doctors force to combat covid-19 through teleconsultation there are thousands of cancer patients who are treated with radiation therapy and chemotherapy in many outpatient oncology facilities throughout the country there are many guidelines for prioritizing the various aspects of cancer in order to mitigate and negate effects of covid-19 let's listen from the experts about these guidelines and challenges to cancer care during covid-19 i take the privilege to welcome honorary members here and one of them are dr shashidara mk who is a anesthesiologist from nhs edgel university img and scs clinical tutor and associate specialist peri operative anticoagulation lead in stockport nhs foundation trust care panel member for international recruitment division for medical and non medical workforce wwl edge hill university and health education of england he is a panel member of he north west and sas doctors funding committee and is also a honorary senior lecturer in edge university he has been consistently helping us in bringing eminent speakers from uk on board to help us be upgraded on any new developments learnings in clinics and hospitals with respect to covid-19 and other health awareness i warm welcome on board dr shashidara mk and handing over this panel to him to introduce dr amar deshpande as well as dr sandeep roy over to you dr shashidara mk thank you very much thank you thank you vidya shankar uh, for such a lovely introduction and thank you very much for making an opportunity for people like me originally citizens from india then had to migrated here and to be able to contribute something some way or the other in the times of distress and coin pandemic is universal and is affected several countries and different parts of the world have have respond in different way i think the covid 19 pandemic is really really causing a lot of havoc in india now we have just been able to come out of it unfortunately i think last week we have gone back to limited lockdown in manchester because of some outbreaks second outbreaks but not huge amount nothing like what is happening there uh least we can do is to share some knowledge education because i did say i was in a webinar yesterday i did say that india is a developed country now it's no longer developing you know it's not like that so there is a great opportunity for knowledge and exchange of ideas and that's been happening through what is known as a global medical program that's where i'm mainly involved with i have now the pleasure of introducing dr sandeep naik i think he's dr sandeep naik has been uh, in medical practice for more than uh, 20 years and uh, was remember is that he is got after his mbbs he did double dnb dnb in general surgery and dnb in surgical oncology more importantly that he has got fellowship in laparoscopic and robotic oncology and further training of laparoscopy in all indian institute of medical sciences uh, 
in India, they do practice surgical oncology. So he is a surgical oncologist. That means his experience in some in terms of dealing with cancer is enormous, and he deal with m most cancers. I think the to tell. I think he's probably one of the leading robotic assisted breast thyroidectomy surgeries and head and neck surgery. That's what he does. And over the last year, he's already done about 100 laparoscopic surgery at Fortis Hospital in Bangalore. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. But in addition to this, he's very keen in terms of doing volunteer work, in terms of creating cancer awareness, is associated with various NGOs, connect to HEAL in Indian Cancer Society. He holds several cancer awareness camps and spread, spread a message across in terms of early detection of cancer, coming to the specialist early, trying to get the treatment early. And why we had Mr. Ahmad Deshpande talking about cancer services, how it has been affecting uh, affected us in UK. Dr. Sandeep Naik is going to give a little bit of overview about what is it in India, how they are dealing with it. Word to you, Dr. Naik. Thank you, Dr. Sashidara, and good afternoon to all. Uh, so, uh, thanks for the organizers uh, to have invited me, and it's a good, a great pleasure uh, to be on such a good forum. I'll just share my slides first. Um, Yes. Okay. So I'll be talking about cancer care during this pandemic and how uh, and what we have done so far. So the scope of this uh, discussion will be to understand the COVID situation and how cancer treatment is affected by this uh, in India. Uh, what are the or what is the con uh, can concern about cancer patient itself? You know how why is it so important, and what changes did we make in the entire process, and what do we expect in future? One disclaimer is that you know I've used many of uh, the images from various journals and all that uh, with credit to them. And uh, all these uh, are authenticated journals which are scientific publications. <clears throat> uh, you heard Dr. Amar and he presented regarding the uh, COVID situation and how they dealt with uh, it in UK in their, in their setup. We are actually following the countries like UK and U US in the number of cases that we are seeing because they have already uh, cross the peak and they are on the other side in the declining phase. So they are seeing a better situation now than what they were. And our cases are gradually increasing and going up the number. So, so where we are today, they have already been there and where they are. Uh, and you know that, so we are able to learn from what they are doing and what we should do will be, uh, you know, it's very easy for us to copy what they have done so far to get, you know, uh, a good kind of a setup and see what is more effective than just, you know, making our own methodology. Now, what good thing happened for us was we had a lockdown for about a month plus, which really delayed our curve and possibly got it down under this line where we are able to manage it quite effectively till date. So we are still under the curve. Hopefully we will not go above the curve where we will not face a situation like what the uh, countries like uh, Spain or for that matter Italy faced wherein it was a devastation. So but when these things started happening when we had uh, the lockdowns imposed there was an information overload. There was media frenzy. We had a lot of such information which was, which was not correct and which was, which was not researched. And opinionistic things came up. And 
that affected the way we functioned but as we have gone on the real data is coming out today now as of now this is what i have got from various sources and this is a comparative uh, study or the uh, statistics of what is happening or what is the real impact of covid 19 look at this this is actually a data for february february to may in 2014 2018 basically an average for all the diseases and that has been compared with the number of covid deaths from uh, this same period this year so look at this this comes third in the list so basically we are dealing with a disease which is you know Uh, which is picking up of course it's not that you know this is the end because this is why i have put the data on this side which is today's data today as of today we have had 682000 deaths so far so in fact it is quite high compared to that but this is you know a disease which is of significance it is causing trouble to us but we cannot ignore the diseases which also cause significant death like heart and cancer so we need to treat these as we are treating or as we are coping with covid 19 now is it is is coronavirus as or sorry covid 19 as deadly as other diseases the fa- the fact is the the disease itself is not as deadly in fact if you see this chart you will understand that the uh, you know the likes of bird flu and ebola are much more deadly rabies is definitely you know a very very deadly disease but the in uh, the death rate when you get the novel coronavirus is quite low it's a you know somewhere around 2.5 to 4% is what is quoted so it is not as dangerous in fact uh, uh, dengue fever is equally dangerous but why is it so important it's important because of the sheer number of cases which will come up because there is absolutely no immunity for this disease in this uh, in the among us so what did we actually do when this lockdown happened or we realized this is a pandemic this was our first reaction what is described as precautionary principle what do we do this is like these two frogs we are in this a boiling pot and the discussion is to whether to have a proof that this is going to cook us alive and then jump out of it or jump out first and then look for the proof that will prove that you know it is going to kill us so most of the uh, most of the governments took the leap first most of the systems took the leap first and then waited for the proof so that's why you see lot of things lot of uh, uh, guidelines which came up earlier in the in the course of the disease being withdrawn as we went on and finally as we go on we'll be left with uh, a lesser number of things which have better proof but it is better to be safe than sorry later on so this is how when it came to cancer this is a very nice diagram which really depicts what we did in the beginning in fact all the weightage was given to corona we said it is better to just wait on cancer on most of the situations we did compromise on the treatment of cancer we did not follow all the uh, standard guidelines and a fresh set of guidelines were made for treating cancer so with with a great lot of respect or weightage given to corona now as time went on we had more information we could you know uh, tailor our treatment and work along with corona virus around us so our systems have improved still it's not perfect lot of things which we are doing are still compromised and there are lot of adjustments which have gone into to try and deliver the best as far as cancer is concerned so what did we change changes to treatment and our practice what all things did we do but we need to understand why we did it also 
So this is one of the data which came out some uh, again in the initial part of the uh, pandemic, which said that you know cancer itself, the presence or the treat ongoing treatment for cancer itself is it predisposes the patient or uh, increases the increases the risk of death among the cancer uh, sorry corona patients. So there are other factors like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and all other factors. But cancer also is one of the factors which increases the death. So now we had to look at cancer treatment very, very seriously because we didn't want our patients to, surrender, uh, to be suddenly pushed into uh, uh, towards death just because we wanted to treat cancer. So we need to choose between the devil or the deep sea. Deep sea. So we reached that situation. We had to make a lot of changes because of this. Also came as a factor which we keep on discussing and I keep on hearing this, deaths among healthcare workers. In fact, healthcare workers were also taken aback. And we thought, you know, yes, is there an increased risk for death? In fact, Again, this also has been debunked and this is not a theory which is hold, holding good today. In fact, I found this very good study which uh, studied you know, more than a lakh patients which included 13,000 healthcare workers. There is a surprise for you here. If you look at this graph, the death among healthcare workers is less than that of the, um, the common public or non healthcare worker deaths so this is not true that uh, you know healthcare workers are you know at a higher risk in fact if you look at the severe disease also appears it appears that you know healthcare workers have a lesser risk of having severe disease compared to the uh, rest of the population could be because we are um, more cautious we are taking more uh, uh, precautionary measures. I don't know. There is no explanation given for this. This is a uh, published. This is a published article. It's available for you to see, and it's a big study with this, which cannot be negated. We cannot say it doesn't exist. So, healthcare worker risk is not the factor here for us to change everything. All our decisions which we have made are only because we wanted our patients to be safe. And we wanted the treatment to be uh, logical. Now, what is the circle of care which we talk about whenever there is a case of uh, a cancer patient or cancer has to be treated? In all our societies, in fact, it's predominantly in India, a family is always involved. A caregiver is a very important factor. And the moment there is a diagnosis, we see that the patients run helter skelter. I see patients going to 10 different hospitals and then coming with a report telling that, you know, I have done. And even whenever I ask them in the initial course of Corona uh, pandemic, they were used to say, I never took the patient. I only went. But unfortunate part is it is, it is not this that matters. You know, in fact, these caregivers did transmit to these patients and the patients were turning positive. In fact, as of today, as we sit in the OPDs and as I manage, when we look at patients, 30% of our patients are coronavirus PCR positive. So that's quite a high number today. They may be asymptomatic. We have had patients, many patients which whom uh, we did the test pre-surgery for a reason, like, you know, uh, we know, you know, because of those uh, reports which came out that, you know, uh, patients who become symptomatic post-procedure have a higher risk of uh, mortality, about 20% risk of mortality. As a practice, we are doing uh, corona PCR uh, for COVID-19 virus in every patient who is going for uh, surgery. So when that is the case, so these caregivers probably have spread the disease to these patients by way of roaming around everywhere. It is possible. So healthcare workers, as we are, we are all very careful. We use all the PPEs and we make sure that the patient does not uh, get infected. So 
my request over here to all the caregivers has been not to indulge in excessive traveling and then infect the patient which could be a detrimental factor for the patient in the post operative recovery if for say for example if you miss the diagnosis of corona pre operatively what change did we do as i told you this change in the clinical uh sorry opd practice what did we change in the opd in fact as dr amir was mentioning earlier we also have made a major change this is a chart which goes to all the patients who come to me for opd uh, clinic opd uh, consultation in fact i have stopped doing direct opds altogether a patient has to book the appointment then the appointment confirmation happens an email is uh, uh, we request for all the emails of all the documents all the investigations that have happened by email to us once we assess those we review the investigations and then we have a consultation with the patient and then the patient comes to the uh, physical examination if needed now there are cases where the physical examination may not be required at all for example if it's a nasophagus or a stomach cancer where we have a good investigation if you look at the patient you know how fit the patient is those patients may not require any physical examination they can be consulted over video and we can do uh, we can assess all the investigations and look at the reports and then make a plan and tell the patient as to what should be done so what i am doing today is i am calling patients only the patient to come to the clinic we exam i examine the patient in the uh, clinic and then send the patient back and rest of the consultation happens uh, over video what is the greatest advantage is again you know when you don't look at a face there is no physical or we don't connect with the patient we can't wear multiple covers over our face and then think that you know all the communication is perfect communication involves lot of expressions lot of understanding yes of course you know it is always better if there is a, the patient person is in front of you but it may not it is not going to happen uh, any time soon so it is it is good if we can have at least you know we can look at the uh, face of the person whom you are communicating with secondly it is uh, also possible for multiple people to join in the discussion and have a have, have more involvement because i have many patients whose children are uh, scattered across the world so they need to they they find it very convenient to come on single platform and discuss with me uh, about the outcomes and what could be done for their loved one so it is possible and there are these are the positives which we are seeing in teleconsultation and maybe i have a feeling that you know for many patients teleconsultation or many consultations we are going to stay in future as well so what are the treatment modifications that we have done over time treatment modifications are the modifications or uh, in the standard care or the guidelines which were there we had to bend them in order to uh, cater to the uh, you know covid situation because of many reasons there was manpower issue there was icu related problem even now we are facing it and many things were happening and there was anxiety about uh, corona which was not so well founded of course so uh, so what you know when you look at any solid tumors the primary treatment is surgery at the end of the day whatever you do most of them have to get surgery to get a cure unless it is stage 4 disease where it is some of the stage 4 diseases also treatable with surgery but most of the times they are not but whenever we want cure we want surgery to happen now what they noticed in the initial period of uh, this the corona outbreak in china this is a chinese paper they studied 34 patients who were undergoing surgery who underwent surgery uh, for uh, 
for cancer and they saw that the mortality when the covid was diagnosed post operatively or after surgery there was a 20% risk of death in these patients so this is a very small number mind you it was just seven patients who died out of 34 patients we don't know the real reason there could have been multiple factors which were involved in this happening but this was a study which made us think whether whether we should take up major surgeries right now we should we change the plan of management it was okay to do all these minor surgeries but major surgeries were significantly impacted by multiple factors so we had to look at the manpower we had to look at the icu uh, post operative care we had to look at the availability of blood in fact we immediately during the uh, you know the lockdown period in our in march we immediately had a blood shortage and blood blood and blood products shortage which is still continuing we are still struggling to get uh, blood and blood products and we are we are uh, you know every day before posting a surgery i look at the chart how many blood products are available of which group can this patient be posted for tomorrow's list or not so that is a situation in which we are today also so these all these factors really played in our mind and when we had to work up and do our surgeries so what all things did we had to change were these you know we had to prioritize the cases we need to th- we had to think you know which is a more or we we have thought you know which cases require a larger importance the cases which would not you know there is no treatment other than uh, surgery had to go for surgery the cases where uh it was not possible to give any alternative form of simple therapies like uh, hormonal therapy uh, and uh, such kind of simple tablets which did not affect the immunity and patient did not have to go through uh, any complicated therapies did not have to come to the hospital were advised only those patients whom whom it was impossible to avoid surgery were uh sent for surgery and rest were put on other forms of treatment sometimes we had to weigh between uh, surgery versus chemotherapy because for example an esophagectomy where esophagus is in the thorax you know doing a thoracic surgery in this time if the patient develops uh, covid related complications in the post operative pe- uh, period the likelihood of that patient coming out of uh, the icu becomes dismally low for that reason we had to put the patient we had to we weighed that you know this is this patient better go for chemotherapy that is safer than to go for surgical uh, uh, surgery so we had to do many modifications if you see you know the priority see here we really uh, you know most of our screening uh, workups and all those things had to stop in fact in between we again started in the month of june but again it is it is uh, you know it is not really a full blown uh, uh, screening programs we have stopped most of these programs because getting a person to come to the hospital itself has become a problem now so what how did it impact surgeon dr amar was discussing how they manage what are the uh, problems that uh, they faced they we also face similar problems we have had to modify the way uh, we practice or we perform our surgeries which did bring down or even now is you know uh, bringing our efficiency uh, significantly down we had to uh, we realized that you know an operative theater is a positive pressure closed environment wherein the risk of infection between people is quite high between people includes between the healthcare staff as well as between the patient and the doctor uh, the healthcare staff in fact uh, between healthcare staff is a important factor to consider because there are more people in the ot uh, more healthcare staff in the ot than 
the patient. So we had to look at every factor and we had to cover every factor when we uh, considered the operative room, how to set up the protocols. We had to make multiple uh, protocols, change them again. And we have come to the uh, few things which could work well and we are following it today. So, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, used to, these were the good times when we used to do uh, surgeries in this fashion. We were all free. These were the free days. In fact, if, uh, you know, if you look at me here, I, in fact, I hardly used to wear any glove when I do robotic surgery. And if you look at my face, uh, I'm not wearing any mask because it's not required during an uh, robotic surgery. See, there is no mask there. So, uh, so these were the days, these were the good old days, what we can call uh, before Corona or BC. And today, the OT situation is different. My assistant is wearing a visor on the face and there is a, a, you know, a respirator over there and I am wearing a mask and it is quite cumbersome to perform surgeries. I am wearing a, a glove on my hand. So it is it is not that comfortable anymore. It is, it is quite considerably uncomfortable to perform surgeries and spend hours uh, performing these surgeries because mo most of her surgeries are quite long. In fact, uh, many of them are, none of them are below six, three hours. So that is the situation. So we are coping with this. We are performing these surgeries. Uh, it is going on, but what do we see in future? Future, though we would see the coronavirus uh, incidences coming down, vaccines may come up. But what is happening today is, you know, we are not having any screening programs. And the early diagnosis has suffered significantly. In fact, none of the screening programs are running to their full effect. In fact, nobody is coming to the screening programs, which means we are missing out on significant number of patients and they will all come with advanced diseases as we uh, maybe after the uh, Corona outbreak is over or when, the, when we start seeing the uh, curve going down. So the, the sad part of it would be the, you know, that they will, many of them will come when the, the symptoms are not bearable and the disease is very advanced. The sad part is also that, you know, the, the cases which are diagnosed in advanced situation will have very, very dismal or very bad outcome or survival. You know, if you look at this, 26% of the stage three and four cases make out of the disease, whereas early cases, stage one and two, 81% would come out of it. In fact, India in India also, we were heading towards early diagnosis. In fact, in my practice, I was seeing quite a good number of early diseases, early cancers. But once this outbreak has started, almost 60 to 70 percent of my cases have become delayed or you know late stages it's an unfortunate uh, situation follow up cases of course are uh, something which you know are a concern because i see some of my patients they do come they do video consultations they want to uh, show but i do see luckily for follow up cases as they are aware that you know they should look for uh, early signs, they come to us much earlier, especially in head and neck and uh, uh, breast cancers. We see patients coming back to us much earlier and uh, we still are okay. I have had uh, at least three cases or four cases uh, last month alone who detected that and they had a recurrence and they approached me quickly. So that is good. The follow-up cases are good. But I think we will suffer in this segment because our screening and early diagnosis is totally hampered. So this is, a, in fact, this is a UK data, which I just pulled out uh, just other day. This is the estimated, uh, you know, raise in mortality because 
of covid uh, related uh, uh, or covid pandemic they are expecting a 20% rise in cancer deaths just because uh, of gp referrals and the uh, you know uh, the cancer related treatments were hampered this is uh, you know this is the uk data we need to see how badly the indian uh, practice has been affected we may or may not may not ever know because our data collection in india is not at as good as the uh, countries like united kingdom and us we do have a hope let's uh, you know two things are possible now either the vaccine is uh, we need to see whether the vaccine comes first or the disease vanishes itself if you know the history of all the viral diseases or most of these uh, flu like viral diseases the disease itself vanished before the vaccine came into existence so they had to really discard the vaccines of uh, uh, sars even mers so all these vaccines you know they could not reach their end because the disease vanished before it happened so let's uh, we don't know what is going to happen but we know that scientifically to release a vaccine it has to go through all the tests and it takes at least minimum at least one and a half years and i have a feeling that the disease will vanish before that but for cancer we don't know how the scenario will be when this you know corona goes and we see the increased number of cases as uh, dr amir was telling you know i also had this very idea that you know you know we are missing what we were doing before this we miss the conferences we miss those family time which we have and we travel to various places and uh, and spend those times to relax but i hope this time uh, those times will come back and uh, we will go on to enjoy those times thank you very much thank you dr naik that was the fantastic and one of the fantastic talk i've heard you know i'm an anesthetist by background and in fact i would probably say is it is so good that i probably will invite you to come and talk to our mch boys here as a part, <laughs> the part of the you. global medical program i think uh, I, i think i will i will take your details i'll get in touch with you once we start the mch <laughs> webinars again we just to stopping for a month in august but then we got to restart i will like to in- invite you that i've already taken permission from amar that i'm going to invite you he is already <laughs> thank you <laughs> so i got a few questions i'm not going to i'm just going to go ask the questions as they have come in the order number one the question number one is from dr anjali there are also some questions from the general public because i think some of the other people also have got into the this one so the first question is from yeah. person called anjali ramesh uh, shall we give papilloma prophylaxis vaccine for the boys and if yes what is the age criteria i i, I don't know who we are going to take this question i'm going to leave it to either of you i, I don't know i have not i didn't get dr baxter uh, dr david baxter the clinical vaccinology a professor who was here three weeks ago doing the webinar i wish i should have asked him to come because he is the person behind papilloma vaccine research he was there he was doing the webinar on corona vaccines and he led the research on in the uh, northwest of england so over to you any one of you otherwise i'll get I'll answer from him anyway. I'll, i'll take it yes. so see uh, the I, <laughs> the question is about human papilloma virus hpv vaccine uh, for boys i guess uh, so the evidence as of now uh, is predominantly for uh, girls in their teenage to take uh, the vaccine but you know there is some emerging evidence and some places it has been approved for uh, boys as well uh, to avoid uh, penile cancer as well as for the oropharyngeal cancer if i guess that is the question about so it is not related to this talk at all but then uh, uh, that is the answer but nothing wrong in giving the vaccine but the approval from um, the uh, you know approving bodies is for uh, girls 
in their teenage the best time to give it is in uh, during teen i i agree with uh, dr sandeep uh, this it's um, uh, we, we answered this question very succinctly but um, the other other advantage of this is the boys um, uh, if they are given the vaccine they won't spread the uh, papilloma virus to the girls when they become sexually active yeah okay thank you so i hope that answers the question the second one is more technical uh, and this is my actually vidya so what are the probabilities of hacking of a robot during a medical procedure wow <laughs> <laughs> so the, the uh, robo is not linked to the uh, you know internet uh, open internet system it does not get hacked uh in fact it is only linked to the server of the um the company intuitive which is actually handling the robo it is not on the open network so it cannot be hacked in that fashion and even if it is hacked it cannot be operated from uh, anywhere as of now uh, rest of the story i'll keep it for some other time <laughs> I, 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 I do know that uh, nowadays the robots being used in multi different people sitting in different parts of the world okay so i'll complete that story then see yeah. the first uh, robotic transatlantic surgery was performed a day before 911 okay so on the day of 911 this was supposed to be published and had to come in the newspapers okay so once that happened that's when the transatlantic uh, sorry uh, tele robotic surgeries were put in the shelves because that you know just imagine the situation if a robo gets and the technology gets in the hand of uh, these uh, terrorists and for that reason it had to be shelved so that is a story so that is why uh, the uh, you know tele robotic surgeries have been shelved for such a long time it it was the first surgery was performed the day before that okay i'm going to uh, i think go on further because we can talk about this uh, this aspect i think these are some general questions which has come from mixture of audiences so what is the what covid 19 symptoms should a breast cancer patient be on the lookout for well uh, it's it, the same symptoms for for breast cancer patients it's not uh, they are not uh, really uh, um, the, the breast specific symptoms um usual ones the uh, f- fever high grade fever uh, dry cough uh, loss of sense uh, sense of smell uh, or sense of uh, uh, taste all 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 those things uh, that that are uh the things with with uh, coronavirus patients the uh, breast cancer doesn't uh, there, there is nothing different from that point of view right so same it's, it's, it's just to add on to that i am diagnosed with breast cancer during my pregnancy is covid test mandatory for me and what precaution should i take should i be worried about feeding my child um we we don't know the effect first of all of uh, corona on the pregnancy and and uh, what what is the outcome of the pregnancy that's that's uh, that um, uh, is is uh, something that that needs to be uh, researched or or seen um in in a few months few years time uh, however um if uh, if 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 the person who's pregnant is isolated uh, shielding or something and completely asymptomatic i don't see any reason why they should have the coronavirus uh, test but there is no harm in having that either um if if there is something a lo- lot of patients are asymptomatic carriers a lot of people are asymptomatic carriers so if they are asymptomatic and corona positive i don't know whether whether that is going to uh be much of a difference uh, what do you think dr sandeep uh yeah that is correct but i think her question was regarding uh, breast cancer and uh, you know her feeding the you know breast feeding the child so yeah. she actually so, apparently devel- had developed breast cancer during uh, pregnancy that's what i right. heard if i'm not wrong right okay so i'm um, uh, so uh, what i'm understanding is is basically um whether corona has anything to do with it is is that right or, or no no i yeah. think you know she has mixed up the two questions actually right 
See, right. I think I'll clarify this. One thing yeah. is, you know, her. Uh, see, you know, there is a confusion among people that cancer patients have a higher risk of uh, breast, uh, corona infection. No, I see. Okay. It is during the treatment only. We are talking about the period of treatment during which the risk of corona infection increases. If you are treated, if you are a sir, you know, you have finished your treatment. your risk is as good as any other person so absolutely that, correct that be very clear yeah Ab- absolutely, absolutely correct. correct can i just add on to that because i have been involved with managing the uh, maternity services f- during the covid so uh, in fact it is surprising that we have we didn't see it's all over uk we have not seen many pregnant corona patients no the num- incidence of covid patients getting needing admission to the hospital during pregnancy is very very low in fact we have we have come out of some of the uh, you know guidance and things like that in maternity far earlier than other areas and that is not only in stockport it's all all over uk and that's what has been conveyed in from the royal college of obstetricians and royal college of anesthetists and this could be something related to the hormonal changes to the metabolic changes uh, to the uh, immunity changes in the immunity uh, uh, related to the various immune proteins that that are uh, secreted during the pregnancy it could be related to that isn't it yeah and and uh, message is message to the public is that yes while they are under treatment for cancer chemotherapy because of the immunosuppression they may be slightly higher risk of covid they need to shield and they need to make sure that they are take appropriate precautions that's correct that's that what we are advising our patients that's what we are advising our patients who go for chemotherapy um, basically their general immunity is low they are generally at a higher risk of developing any infections and corona being an infection uh it 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 stands true f- in in case of corona as well right i think radio therapy is the, not such of a problem yeah. i think it answers the next question as well next question is around if a cancer patient or the cancer survivor feels some early symptoms such as fever cough and should they contact the medical oncologist or a primary care physician i would say both yes <laughs> i would say both because the thing is that first of all uh, we have to rule out whether the uh, um whether there is a neutropenic sepsis going on there and that can be done by the oncologist while um if 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 we need to get the tests done for corona etc uh, that can be facilitated by the primary care practitioner right can i just add so the if the question if i were to dissect the question a bit if the patient has had a cancer many years ago and has been cleared of cancer and not on any further he's been discharged from the cancer care the risk is no different from other person but however the patient who's had a cancer who's still undergoing treatment or some kind it is better they contact their primary care physician they may need early investigation in case they have got symptoms i don't think there is early warning signs early symptoms in these patients any anyway, but better better contact them if you are currently being treated for cancer and and the oncologists as well if if they are especially on chemotherapy uh because we need to see if there is any neutropenic sepsis yes both need to be contacted very important yeah right does having received chemotherapy or radiation in the past raise the risk of getting covid-19 i think um, we have answered that it's yeah, as, you, yeah. as good as uh, anybody else you can get it just like your neighbor yeah right does history of cancer raise your risk of health complication from covid-19 right so we have you know in, within our intensive care uh, people who have had act on active chemotherapy they are more prone for sepsis same way they are more prone for corona virus but if they haven't got a remitted cancer cancer which is been cured they haven't seen any increased complication in this patient any more than any other person yes so i think this may be i don't know what how to put this what is a post operative unstable clinical scenario this is for the general public sorry what is the question post operative what un- is post operative unstable clinical scenario <laughs> it's so <laughs> but i i would say anything that reduces the immunity um so so if if they are 
um, septic or they are on ITU uh, on on lot of support etc. That that is naturally going to drive their immunity downwards, and that is going to make them susceptible for any sepsis, any infection. Excuse me, infections. Um, so yes, those are those are the main uh, um, scenarios where uh, you will be worried about all these things. Um, is that is that the right interpretation? Um, um, Of, of yeah, the, the thing is, post-operative unstable is any, anybody in a post-operative unstable can you know, it can be post-operative sepsis, post-operative complications. It's a very, very vague and very mm-hmm. broad, isn't yep. it? Yeah. yeah. Answer. Uh, what are the cha- this is a question, Toma? Yeah. What are the chances of cancer in men who have gynecomastia? Right. Okay. So gynecomastia is slightly increases the, the um, incidence of cancer in men. Now, uh, for every hundred cancers, breast cancers diagnosed, one is a man. So um, as it is, breast cancer is very, very rare in men, and gynecomastia increases that risk only marginally. So the, if, if we, we can say that, okay, fine, uh, instead of one in hundred, it might be one in eighty. but it's still still very 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 rare so yes there is a slightly increased risk but in um, a general picture in a bigger picture uh, the risk of uh, breast cancer in men is very small and thank you i think let me just quickly have a look i don't think we have any other questions there's nothing on the facebook either gentlemen <laughs> that has fantastic two important webinars and really really good ones and uh, and thank you thank you very much for making time on a saturday especially amar you know saturday being the non working yeah thank you very, thanks for making time and dr naik i'm sure being the head of oncology in fortis you must be a very busy man and uh, thank you for your time <laughs> <Not anymore. laughs> and, uh, thank you very much Ashi, and thank you uh, mr vidya shankar and, and all the organizers it, it was uh, very good to be on this platform is, and sharing it with with dr nayak uh, it it was fantastic experience for me thanks man thank